I found a what is known as a folio point. It's been resharpened down. It was considerably wider here at the base, but over time, the resharpening, it, it was made down to this uh, more of a teardrop shape. Yeah, what identifies it as a folio point is its shape. It has some of a shirtboard uh, willow leaf shape to it. A lot of these items that we find at this site, um, they help help us to build the picture of what lives were like for, for the people who left them here. What we have here is what we call a blade. It's a modified tool, pretty quick to make, and it shows, well, it was generally used like this. It has a sharp edge here and a flat edge here, so it could be used to cut or to scrape. And we know that because you can see tiny chips are broken here, and that's the kind of thing that happens when you scrape it along an edge. This is a tool that was quick to make, it was probably used a few times and thrown away. Right here we have we have a stone we have we excavated. You can see you see on it has some, some burnt up charcoal right here, which we can potentially I think back to uh, the get ready carbon dates for. Also we have what looks like maybe impact marks on the edge. I think it's something that might be a hammer stone. Here's a, st a stemmed point that we found in one of the screens while someone was skim shoveling. And you can see that it's stemmed because of this ear, what's called an ear on the side. Now, what the stem point used to look like was it was much longer and it might have broke, so they started to work it down again. This is a lancelet projectile point. Uh, it's made out of Salmon River Greenstone and we found it in the fill level, uh, which is from 1930s when they made the road down here from Cottonwood. And we actually found this in the screen. We didn't find it in the actual fill itself, uh, which was really a neat experience to find a point in the screen. You see this, and it's so unique to what we find around here. But that is a Salmon River Greenstone Lancelet. So right here we have a point that had been resharpened. We found this in Little Strap Unit 8, which is uh, mostly uh, it's probably from a wind dust era, era so a beach sand deposit. So putting around 8,500, 10,000. Um, a dozen years ago. This is a good example of a blade. This was struck from a core in this fashion. It came off this way. It has evidence of other flakes being removed from it. This could be used as a tool as it is, or it could be further modified. Here we have an example of a cherry unit face. Uh, the material is cryptocrystalline silicate, chert for short. And um, you can see the unidirectional flakes coming off one side of the flake, none on this side. And these unidirectional flakes would have been going across the whole edge, but through use wear and breaking, it's now only on. Okay, so what we have here is a what we call a blade, um, and it would have been used to scrape hides or to cut bones or anything you could use as a knife. Um, and what's interesting about it is it probably would have been on a core that would have had been made to, or used to been make a lot of these. They would have prepared the core such that they could strike it at the top and knock off these blades one after another. And if you look really closely, you can tell that the blade has been used out on the edge. Um, and that's what we call use wear. Um, and it would have been hit from this angle, from this direction, because you can see the bulb right here and the uh, force moved through this way through the, through the blade as it was knocked off the core. Beauty. I'm Lauren Davis and I'm going to show you some examples today of how stone tools are made through a process that's known as flint napping. To do this process we have to have some basic things. One, we have to have a suitable rock that lacks 
a significant crystalline structure and we also uh, need to have a series of small tools that allow us to break the rock in a reliable, predictable kind of way. So I'm going to take my hammer stone, I'm going to hit downward on the rock and it's going to break a piece of this obsidian nodule. As promised, one, one hit, one flake. So we're able to cleave this apart because, if you, I don't know if you can see this very well, but there are ripple marks in this that show the direction of force. I hit it here, the force traveled through and detached off this flake. This flake is extremely sharp on the edges and it makes a superior uh, material for the production of stone tools. And we're going to attempt to prepare what's known as a core. So we want to remove some of this outer rind. This is called the cortical cover or just simply cortex. I'm going to regularize the face by removing a series of flakes off of this so that I can begin to remove off a very predictable controlled kind of product. So now after just the removing of a few flakes, I've got the beginnings of what we might consider to be a core. Now I'm using this rock to rough up the edge a little bit so that I can strengthen what's called the platform, the platform of the top of the core, but it will also be the platforms of the individual flakes that I remove. I want them to be able to bear enough strength, enough force as I hit it that they don't just simply shatter. I want the force to travel through this thin flake really nicely. You can see there's a series of ridges, these straight lines that go down. I'm going to basically hit on tops of those and try to drive long thin flakes off of these. So here's the first one. So you can see the force traveled right down the middle of the ridge. You can see the negative scar from which it was removed. This is extremely useful. We can use this as it is, as a tool. It's got a razor sharp edge and I can use that for all kinds of cutting, scraping, and sizing uh, kinds of actions. And uh, I can also take this, shape it a little bit farther with other kinds of percussive reductions, or I can even use a technique called pressure flaking, where I take the tip of an antler and I push it against the side and I pop off very small controlled flakes to shape it in a final effort. So a lot, just like that. So now I'm going to take one of the flakes that I produced by using the hammer stone, knocking them, them off of the core earlier, and I'm going to make a very simple uh, durable tool called a biface. And bifaces can be thought of as knives. If you refine them down and make them very thin and give them uh, what's called a hafting element, something you can tie onto something else, you can even throw them and use them as projectile weapons. So first, I need to prepare the edges to be able to uh, take the kind of napping kinetic force I'm going to be applying with this rock. So my goal is to get this a little bit thinner while getting the edge uh, in a regular manner so that when I look at it, it's kind of balanced. So what I'm doing is striking the rock in a very oblique manner. Only a very little bit of this hammer stone actually will touch the edge and it will cause really thin flakes to be driven off. So this side doesn't have any flakes removed from it yet, but this side was the thicker side, so we had to make it thinner. Now I'm going to prepare the edges again for another series of percussive reductions. So I'm just simply striking off flakes, then rotating it, in order to make sure that I'm getting enough continuous flaking all the way around. So now, it's thin enough that if I had to, let's say, take the joints apart on a large animal like an elk, this could fit inside the joints and actually begin to work them apart.
you remember it started out as a much larger flake, but this is a nice usable biface. I can simply use this for all kinds of cutting tools. As it gets dull, I can resharpen it over and over until it like, gets either too small or breaks. Then I'll throw it away, and if I was a person of the past, some archaeologist might find it thousands of years later.